All right, everybody, good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to a special co-hosted and co-sponsored webinar brought to you by the Lake States Fire Science and the Tallgrass Prairie and Oak Savannah Fire Science Consortia. I'm Jack McGonzinski, and I serve as the program manager for the Lake States Consortium. Craig Meyer is also with us, and he is the Tallgrass Prairie and Oak Savannah Fire Science Coordinator. We will be moderating the webinar this afternoon. Today we have a webinar that highlights multi-scale responses of Eastern Massasauga rattlesnakes to prescribed fire, presented by Matt Cross. For those who may be joining us for the first time, let us give you a little background. Both consortia are funded by the Joint Fire Science Program, which are two of the 14 regional consortia across the country. Our mission is to accelerate the awareness, understanding, and adoption of wildland fire science information by federal, tribal, state, local, and private stakeholders. For the Lake States region, this includes Michigan, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and the adjacent Canadian provinces of Ontario and Manitoba. The Tallgrass Prairie and Oak Savannah Consortium con covers portions of 11 states, encompassing much of the historic range of the Tallgrass Prairie, from southern Michigan and central Ohio to the eastern Dakotas and Kansas. We are working with a wide range of people with the stake in managing fire adapted ecosystems in the region, including private landowners, non profit organizations, and state and federal agencies, much like our counterparts in the Lake States. The consortia strive to be inclusive and neutral science partners, working to foster collaboration among researchers and practitioners, organizations and individuals, and by developing innovative approaches to science delivery while facilitating dialogue about new science findings and emerging needs. All right, before we get started, I would like to explain our webinar interface using Adobe Connect. First, if you'd like to ask a question or interact with the attendees, please use the chat box that is in the lower left-hand portion of your screen. Once you type your question, just click the Send button. Craig and I will be monitoring these questions and we'll make sure that there is an opportunity for Matt to address them. Second, we recommend that you maximize the webinar window on your computer for the best viewing. Finally, if you would like to learn more about the two consortia and what we are doing, please visit our website. You can look for information at lakestatesfireside.net or toposfirescience.org. Please sign up to receive our newsletters and announcements of other activities. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. With that, I'd like to introduce Matt Cross. Matt is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Biological Sciences at Bowling Green State University. Matt received his Master of Science degrees in Conservation Biology and Geographic Information Sciences while working with Massasauga rattlesnakes. He then took up research on box turtles in the Oak Openings region of Northwest Ohio. His research efforts focus on spatial ecology, behavioral ecology, wildlife ecology and management, and integrating these fields with GIS to make predictions that can guide conservation efforts. With that, I'm going to turn control of the webinar over to Matt. Take it away. All right. Thank you, Jack. And I'd like to thank everyone uh, for joining us today. Um, I'm just going to this is just going to be talking about uh, my master's work from Central Michigan University. I've changed locations now, um, but without further ado, we'll kind of get started here. Um, and if I am going too fast, someone please uh, feel free to let me know because I tend to get all all kinds of wound up. Uh, but the, again, the title of the talk today is "Multi-Scale Responses of Eastern Massasauga Rattlesnakes to Prescribe Fire." Uh, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about the snakes themselves. Uh, here's a very classic photo uh, put, uh, put forth by a friend of mine. Uh, they, you know, these are very small snakes. They're stout-bodied pit vipers, um, and that's really all much all the back, background. Uh, most of the background will give you. And uh, if you have any specific questions about Massasaugas uh, and their ecology, please feel free to ask myself uh, after the talk. Um, okay. So just a little bit of background on the. Uh, on their distribution. So the current range for Massasaugas extends from Iowa and Missouri up through uh, Canada and into New York. And you can see that this is a <clears throat> this is a little bit older map, but we can see here there are these red counties where the snakes were extirpated from, yellow are likely extirpated, and blue are extant. And again you can see from this date that this is kind of this is kind of a dated map, but this is one of the better uh, assessments we have uh, for their distribution. They receive varying degrees of protection throughout this, uh, this area. They're threatened and endangered in some places, uh, or speak to special concern. Uh, and that's the case in Michigan, uh, where Michigan has kind of been called the last stronghold 
for these snakes. Uh, you can see here from uh, looking at these two pictures that it's, there, it's the state that has the most number, the most number of counties that have extant populations. And again, these, these maps are a little bit older, but uh, they kind of give you an idea of what we're looking at in Michigan here. So these snakes are typically found in open wetlands, and in particular, it's uh, we, we see prairie fens pop up in the literature. Now, this isn't always the same as prairie fens aren't necessarily abundant, but we do we, we do we do tend to see that the prairie fens are uh, a, a, a cons are consistent, and they uh, they generally exhibit a, a shift in movements uh, throughout their season. So in spring and fall, they're going to be down in these lower wetland areas, and in summer they will move to adjacent upland sites. Now again, this is going to be <clears throat> dependent on the area and the habitat available, but this uh, this shift in habitat is, uh, is a very common thing that we see with the Mathisaugas. Uh, and again, the prairie fens, which is where this study is taking place, uh, is what's going to be the focus uh, along with the snakes of this, uh, this talk. So this is just a, a brief little part on you know, why the Matsusagas are on the, on the decline. Uh, they share a lot of these <clears throat> similar uh, threats with other, reason, with other animals, uh, you know, organisms. So we know that habitat loss and fragmentation can be particularly detrimental. Uh, again, they they have these seasonal shifts in habitat, and they use the same areas over and over again. So loss of critical habitat and then fragmentation through roads or just destruction can cause them to uh, can create unusable habitat and cause population declines. Um, with snakes, there are a few more uh, little specific causes of mortality and decline. So road mortality is a big one. Uh, now, we see the road mortality with a lot of organisms, but Snakes, uh, reptiles in general, are some of the only species where we see intentional road mortality. Um, and that kind of ties into persecution. Uh, being a snake, they are targeted, and then rattlesnake, you know, they're even <laughs> even more of a target species for people who are, aren't fans of snakes. And so uh, we see uh, we see that this is a uh, potential for a uh, for declines. A collection is another one. You know, there used to be bounties on massasaugas, but that was dated, and that's no longer the case, but uh, even private collection of, you know, just herpetological collectors who really want this cool, small, uh, unique snake in their, their little collection. Uh, recently, there's been an outbreak of uh, Chrysosporium. I think there was a webinar on that uh, just Tuesday. Uh, I'd miss it, but uh, so this is a cause of concern, uh, you know, spreading to populations and uh, whether or not this can contribute to all these other factors. And then what the of today's talk is going to be management. Uh, there's concern of whether or not management, so uh, specifically described fires and mowing and what have you, are negatively impacting populations. And uh, this is, the, the management is uh, deemed necessary to maintain those habitats, and we still, we still want to make sure that we are managing the populations correctly. And so of the threats we see here, Management is the one that it, we can fo we focus on because it's it's easier and that's a kind of easier to uh, to alter than all the rest of these. So there's there isn't much that we can we can put forth policies to halt habitat loss and fragmentation, but it can be very difficult. There's not a whole lot we can do about road mortality other than maybe close roads or put up signs, which you know is again carries their own uh, legwork with them. So management is nice to focus on because. To some extent, the managers can control what's going on, and so if we can manage in a way that's beneficial to the snakes, then everyone's happy. So just a brief back background on fire. Um, we know that fire is a very effective management tool, and not only is it a tool, it's a very important ecological process that is uh, that contributes to uh, the diversity and uh, maintains these ecosystems. And in the prairie fens, like we're, ta we're talking about today, it is, one of the, it is one of two primary processes maintaining that fen community, the other one being hydrology. So these ecosystems and these habitats depend on frequent disturbance either through fire or hydrology to maintain the open areas that are necessary for massasaugas and other species. This here is just a brief stepwise kind of model of what we see when we're uh, for, for fen restoration. So if you have up here, your pristine fen community maintained by periodic fire and your hydrology. Now, as we alter the hydrology and suppress fire, you can see that you kind of get a 
a downward uh, spiral here where your invasives start to roll in and then eventually you get an area that is dominated by buckthorn. Uh, so then the goal here is then, you know, with, with uh, treatment and herbicide application, uh, you can eventually build the, the restore the fan in this pristine area where you've removed your invasives, you have a, a fire regime, and, you're, and you've uh, removed some of these, uh, these old tiles from some of these fields. So again, we, we know that fire is um, it's very valuable in preventing the spread of woody encroachment and invasives. So as these, uh, with these prairie fens, uh, you know, natural succession is constantly pushing in on them and then they have the complication of buckthorn uh, that, we, that we use this to fight to, to compete that or co combat that. <clears throat> also fire can help uh, eliminate, eliminate potentially dangerous fuel loads and it's also very cost and time effective when compared to some of these other methods such as manual removal. And down here in the lower right-hand corner is just a, uh, a quick example of um, a fen that was in southeastern Michigan that in 1995 was just almost all, that was dominated by buckthorn. So you can see in this picture that this is, this is what it looked like down there. It was, it was ranked unsuitable for massive saugas. It was just solid buckthorn. And Nature Conservancy started aggressive treatment of it. And eventually, uh, by you know, time 2003 rolled around and a colleague, Jen Moore, was doing research down there, uh, she had great luck finding massive saugas. And uh, it's, it's, very, very, it's very nice habitat now. Um, and so with that, we know the, with some of these studies that we've seen, we know that there's mortality reported. So with the burn down here in this fen, uh, there was, we, they saw mortality in two snakes. Um, and similar mortality were reported in some other studies. But we, we know very little about what happens to the snakes post-fire. So direct mortality is easier to, accept, to assess than uh, what happens after the fire. And easier is just uh, the tentative uh, <laughs> uh, term because um, it's not always easy to find them after the fire. But uh, it's, it's, it's the best uh, indicator you have of, what, of mortality that you, were, you, might have, you might have seen. So, while the, there are benefits, there are uh, you know fire can cause some mortality. We do know that there are some benefits, and again, we've talking, kind of talked about this with the fen restoration, and the big one is habitat improvement. Improvement. So we know that succession can create unfavorable vegetation structures um, for the snakes, particularly when it comes to thermal regulation and um, in general just habitat quality. So like we saw with that uh, really grown over fen example. Uh, it can, we, we know it can be beneficial for the, the have, can create beneficial habitat for the snakes as well as their prey. Um, so the, it's altering that vegetation structure can bring in uh, more prey items and um, can, uh, you know, can benefit the snakes in, indirectly. Another big one is thermal regulation. So thermal regulation is arguably the most important aspect of uh, an, any ecotherm, uh, particularly these snakes' uh, life. It will govern you know, their activity and survival, pretty much everything. And so following described fires where there's, you, you kind of open the area up and you have the black in the, uh, on the ground, uh, there have been studies that have found the ground temperature and surface radiation have increased. Uh, so this, I, in, uh, what the, the idea behind this is it's creating uh, better or more efficient thermoregulatory sites for the snakes. And we've also seen reported uh, diversity following fires where just an increase in the number of herpetofauna are found in the burned area uh, post burn, and this could be because of possibly prey or thermal regulation, um, but uh, it also could be just because they're easier to find. Uh, for Massasauga specifically, we know that more are found, uh, we, that in some cases, more are found after the fire. Uh, for instance, in that burn at, uh, in southeastern Michigan, uh, there were originally, you know, there were 23 snakes found in the burn area in months following the fire. 13 of them were new snakes, they been unmarked and weren't were part of a telemetry study. Um, so we have some, some evidence here of, you know, massive saugas preferably moving into these uh, burned areas. And that's kind of like a, it, they, they could be using it because it's, uh, it's better for thermal regulation, but it could just be easier to find. Anyone who's gone for massive saugas can tell you that they're very, very cryptic. And so finding more after a fire could be because they're using it preferentially, or just could be because there's nowhere for them to hide. So with, with the advantages of fire, um, and again, mostly the, the advantages uh, we just talked about were for the snakes. We have to remember that this is for the whole fen community. 
Um, but we also we see that mortality. Uh, as we can see here, this is a picture of those two snakes that were burned in that uh, in that fen we were talking about. And this one was a, you can see the, the caudal third of the body got a little bit scorched. And that's, uh, and so direct mortality is often a disadvantage of fires. Um, with the snakes, um, oh, sorry, reduction of cover could be an issue. So with, you know, are they, if they're just easier to find, you can see increased predation. And I think that was, uh, that's what was observed in the Derby in 2006 study where after they mowed prior to a burn, um, one of their snakes was picked off uh, by a, a, a predator. Um, so it could just be that the reduction of this cover makes them more susceptible to predation. Uh, we could see the, the flip side of the benefits of thermal regulation where the area gets too hot too fast. So they, they can't thermoregulate optimally and they don't use the area or, you know, the ones that are there uh, are at a disadvantage. And we could also see changes in prey abundance and ability that uh, negatively impact the snake. So for each one of these benefits, there's kind of like a flip side that, you know, it, one, you, you could have one or the other. So for Massasaugas, and this is, and again, these burn recommendations we're going to talk about for Massas, uh, are specifically for Massasaugas. And the general, the general one, the big one that you hear a lot, is to burn before spring emergence or after they've gone under in the winter. And so what the idea behind this is, if you burn when they're underground, you don't, you don't run the risk of killing any snakes. Uh, so you also, there's also some flexibility here in some of these, uh, some of these recommendations where not burning after April is recommended, but then this has been extended to May 15th, May 15th for wetlands specifically. Uh, looking at temperatures of the uh, soil and air uh, has been suggested as a way to kind of uh, set up timing for fires. And there's been some research that has looked at Massasaugas and box turtles and uh, in, in inversion in temperature when that's when the snakes emerge. So if you're watching soil and air temperatures, uh, managers can kind of figure out when the best uh, burn window would be. Now, all of these are good. Uh, however, that uh, these, these dates and conditions don't necessarily uh, meet up with management objectives. So for burns to be, we said burns are very cost effective, but in order that's just a relative term. In order for them to be most effective, you want to be implementing burns when they're going to do the most work. So burning during these recommended burn dates down here when the mass saugas are underground aren't going to, it's not going to meet your management objective. It's not going to be as effective. It's going to be, um, it might be, it might be partially effective, but it, in the grand scheme of things, it will be uh, a, uh, I hesitate to say waste of time and money, but just not a, a, a good use of your time and money if you're planning on uh, this, this large-scale restoration. So we see down here for your most efficient growing, uh, your most efficient growing season burn, the window from kind of mid-May to October, and there's a very short window. There's a short window of overlap when you have your most efficient burns and uh, your recommended burn dates, and even this April to May uh, burn window down here for Massasaugas it's pretty late into in their recommended burn season. Uh, so we know for mass, for not, not sorry, not for mass slaughters, I'm getting hijacked. We know for reptiles in general uh, that there have been uh, some behavioral response models of, um, you know, predicting how, they, you know, how this, the organisms will respond after a fire. And we can see that uh, this, this research from uh, Kali, they found that, you know, you, you can have, you have generally three different response models of uh, reptilian abundance following fires. Now, follow-up research to this found that um, half to two-thirds of the reptile species they studied showed unexpected responses uh, in relation to these response curves. And so this kind of led to a, a follow-up where um, we, they've, uh, oh, uh, where um, management is best guided by setting objectives to meet um, particular conservation goals. So um, in this case, we know that massasaugas are a species of concern in these prairie fens. And so the, the hope here is to set up, up these prescribed fires and management plans in ways that will meet our Massasauga conservation goals. Okay, so um, pretty much, you know, the, this all boils down to, you know, why is this important? Um, Massasauga has been a, endangered, a candidate for a listing on the Endangered Species Act since 1999. Um, they, we, we, as, we, we, as we showed you earlier with that, um, uh, this distribution slide, uh, you can see that they, they are experiencing declines throughout their range. There has been some research 
that has shown that loss of a few individuals can lead to these drastic population declines uh, further on down the road. And it, it, didn't, it doesn't take much to kind of push it over the edge. And we really want to make sure that, we're, that with these range-wide declines, um, the remaining populations, we want to make sure we're managing for these, uh, these populations correctly because, you know, if we're losing a few of the burns, um, it may not be, uh, that, may, that may affect long-term survival. So we really want to conduct this research to, um, you know, make sure we're, we're uh, managing in the best ways for the snakes. So uh, this kind of brings us to the objectives of this study. Uh, our primary objectives were to determine the direct and indirect effects of fires on the Massasaugas. So first off, assess direct mortality, you know, so see how many are are killed during the burn, um, but we all, you know, we also want to do some follow-up because that's not that's all. That might not be the best assessment of, you know, the, the long-term impacts. So then, uh, we also want to look at, you know, the benefits. Uh, you know, are more found after the fires, um, and you know, are the snakes using this area preferentially? So if we burn in an area where we know we have snakes that have transmitters, uh, do they then move into that area to, you know, for prey from regulation? what have you. And then this is uh, yeah, kind of where yeah. The, yeah. yeah, sorry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in here, folks. Just um, looks like some people are not seeing the slides. Um, I apologize. This may be our webinar platform. It may be working a little slow. So I'll ask Matt to kind of move the slides through the slides slower, and we'll see okay. if that uh, corrects it. Um, and I apologize. This is being recorded, so um, everything looks good on my I am, so if you can't see this, you might have to review it through the recording, but we'll try to continue forward. Thanks, Matt. Okay. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Um, so I'll try to go a little bit slower. Uh, and so then really, uh, so our, our third sub-objective was looking at the direct and indirect effects. Um, it's kind of where the big part of this research came in, um, examining daily movements, home range sizes, and habitat utilization following a prescribed fire to see if there are drastic changes that um, you know, could affect them down the road. Uh, we also wanted to evaluate uh, substrate and refugia, uh, and bur sorry, substrate and burrows in the uh, prairie fen as refugia. So my time working with these snakes, um, I know when I first started this, a lot of people told me that when approached, Massasaugas will coil up and rattle. And I actually found <laughs> that that wasn't the case at my study site. Uh, whenever when they would, when I would approach them, a lot of times they would just bolt and they would find cover in under hummocks or even go down any any open burrow in the habitat and so the thought here is you know if they're disturbed by a fire maybe they use these refugia and we wanted to see if they were um, sufficient to protect them from a fire and then another another important objective we had here is we wanted to collect very detailed fire data um, so uh, something that I noticed reading a lot of these uh, you know these, these, these articles and such is that there's very little reports of what the fire itself did. And so in, from Andrew's perspective, if someone, if you guys are trying to, um, you know, put pre prescribed fires in Massasauga areas, you know, you, you really want to know what, like every detail of that burn so that if it's possible to apply that type of burn to your, your the area you're managing, um, you know, then, you know, that, that'll be useful information. So for this project, there were two study sites. Um, we have the Paw Paw Prairie Fen up here. Uh, sorry, I just shorthand abbreviate that Delta PF. And then ELF down here, the Ed Lowe Foundation. Um, for the remainder of this talk, we're going to be focusing primarily on the snakes at Paw Paw Prairie Fen. Ed Lowe Foundation ends up being our control site. So just to streamline this and make things a little bit less confusing with the slides, um, we're going to focus on the Paw Paw Prairie Fen. However, I should emphasize the Ed Lowe Foundation did play a critical role in this, and uh, they put up with me. So. Uh, Good, to, good for them. All right. So the Paw Paw Prairie Fen, the, the mission here is to restore and maintain the habitat for all of these species. So this fen was ranked as one of the top five fens in the state by MNFI. Uh, so it's a, it's a very important habitat. It's home to a wide variety of endangered, threatened, of concerned species. And uh, oftentimes we get kind of tunnel vision and want to focus on you know, just our species of interest. And we do need to remember that there are other species that depend on these on what's going on with this management. Um, but again, we do want to make sure that we're 
uh, we're looking at, this, at the, the mass of sagas. And in my mind, if we are managing for a one of the, 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 the stouter, slower moving snakes, then we might be, then other snakes might be able to, you know, outrun or uh, respond uh, appropriately to a fire. So again, the Papa Prairie Fen. This is a. This was just kind of an interesting case where it was slated for construction, and you can see down here on the left-hand side where this uh, this this trail has been uh, kind of torn in. Uh, this, uh, this at one point in time, this area had been a an oak savanna, so we know that's definitely a conservation priority. And then to get to here, there had been a little uh, footbridge put in. You can see down there. Um, so what they'd done is they they leveled this oak savanna. They had altered the hydrology of the fen, and then construction was halted, and this became a mitigation site. TNC, uh, the Michigan chapter, took this over and began aggressive management, uh, restoring this upland area to, in an attempt to bring back that oak savanna. As you can see down here, they removed that, that, foot, that land bridge and restored the hydrology of the area, uh, began manual removal of a lot of the invasive species in what is this uh, this right out here is the prairie fen area proper, and then began prescribed fires. In 2006, I believe, the first prescribed burn took place down in this area. Um, so this is just, it provided a really unique case study of, um, you know, a disturbed system where we had this species of interest and we, and managers are using a tool that uh, has been taking some heat in the literature for its impact on the, on the snakes and so this was kind of a, a good setup for the project we had in mind. So in terms of the snakes, we just kind of, we went out and we searched for them. Uh, in April to June, this began in 2007. We took all of our snakes to a local veterinarian to be implanted with transmitters. And this, I just like this picture because you can see the pit tag and the transmitter. Uh, snakes were allowed to recover for two to three days, in some cases more, before released uh, exactly their capture site. And uh, then they were, then we began the telemetry portion of the study. Uh, it was also nice to have the vet on hand because, uh, as we'll kind of talk about a little bit later, um, if we, our goal was, we cleared this with him, if we found any carcasses as a, as a result of the burn, we would bring them to him for necropsy to assess whether or not the burn was actually responsible for the, the death rate. So in 2007, we began establishing movement patterns of the snakes at the two study sites. Uh, and again, so in 2007, we had five males and eight females. And in 2013, the year of the burn, uh, we just we had a few, uh, a, kind of a little bit of a switch in numbers. And remember, this is for the, the, the uh, between the two study sites. And the snakes were tracked every one to four days, and uh, we kind of randomized the order of the tracking, you know, typical telemetry uh, snake tracking stuff. And uh, we were able to track them before, during, and after the burn. So we had, you know, some some data in 2007. Uh, we had emergence data, and then the nature of the fire actually allowed us to walk behind the burn to monitor the snakes during, and then we followed them uh, up until right around October, right before they, uh, sorry, September, uh, before they would start moving into overwintering. Uh, and so the, the, te the temperatures, or the, sorry, oh, geez, man, sorry. The, uh, <laughs> the transmitters had a temperature sensor in them, and that allowed us to assess the, get a relative idea of the body temperatures during the fires. And then we also weighed the snakes at the end of the season to uh, just kind of see, you know, if you could, if there's a noticeable difference in body weights of snakes on or off the fire, you know, are the ones in the burn area, do they then, are they <laughs> less efficient at finding prey, and that kind of affects them, and that would really, uh, could really hurt them going into overwintering. And um, on the day of the burn, our snakes were assigned uh, different treatment groups depending on their position. And uh, I'll show you some maps here of the, of the burn unit in a second, but our snakes were uh, in the group. There were five snakes on the burn unit, uh, three snakes at the same site off the burn unit, and then we originally had five snakes at our control site. They had low foundation. And uh, then two of them got picked off, and so that left us with three. Uh, so that was unfortunate, but again, that, that happens with studies like this. So for our telemetry data, um, we, uh, at, the, at the time, sorry, uh, it, at the time, RGS 10.1 didn't exist. I redid all this uh, recently for a publication working on. 
Uh, but for the movement and home ranges, we plotted out uh, MCPs, which is the minimum convex polygon. Down here, that's simply the minimum bound polygon around your points. Uh, then we also generated kernels using uh, some, at the time, again, some newer methods by Rowan, Blue, and Demers. And the kernel is just this, uh, this wavy line here. And this here's an, uh, an example of the math plug is. And uh, what, the, what this new method did is it used the area of the MCP to delineate the area of the, the kernel, whereas normally it's, uh, you let the computer decide what the, the size of the kernel. And this was going to then so we used these for our habitat utilization uh, part for the behavioral study. So we assessed uh, habitat use at microhabitat scale. So at the individual points, we took the suite of environmental and structural data, uh, macro habitat within the snake's home range, and then at the landscape scale. So the, the utilization within a larger scope. So for our study, we ended up using uh, the same method as Moore and Gillingham in 2006 where each, all of our points were buffered by the, the length of the longest uh, home range. And so that was kind of our rough estimate of what was available to all of our snakes during our study. Now this is just kind of a, I, I can't explain how uh, off the hip this, uh, this, this, this was, and this was kind of just like a preliminary study. Uh, but the TNC uh, managers were really interested in, in how fast the, the massive sagas could move because they can, they can kind of alter the speed of their burns. And so I was approached, you know, how fast does a mass saga move? I, to which I had no idea. Um, so we took seven of our snakes and we placed them into this little kind of quickly made testing area. Uh, they were placed in the center and then a researcher would approach them with a snake hook. And really all it took was a gentle tap and then the snakes would move along. And um, so we tested our snakes in this just to just to get a rough estimate. Like I, I can't ex I cannot stress how much of a rough estimate this was, but it's it's better than nothing. Um, so we had an average speed of uh, 2.34 meters per second, and feet per second is down here just as a reference for managers. And I apologize, I, I messed this up. Uh, fire is usually reported in uh, feet per minute, I believe. Um, so there's this will pop up again. So just I apologize for that in advance. So we had our we had our snake speed, which was uh, man, they were actually pretty tickled with. Um, and so before we get too carried away with the snake speed, because this was very interesting, there are some caveats. Uh, the, the snakes were not uh, distant sprinters. They they rarely moved about six feet in a straight line uh, before they kind of tired out, if you will. Uh, we we tested each snake three times, and they definitely were slowing down the third time. We allowed them about a ten to fifteen minute break in between trials. And, uh, but they, they did eventually slow down or they just realized that we weren't going to hurt them and we just had enough of it. Um, and they weren't tested in their natural habitat. They were tested in this grass air, grassy area by our base of operations. And the reason for this was because I tried this in the fen and they moved about a foot before they'd find a little hole or crevice or something and just disappear. Uh, so that wasn't giving me the results we needed. Uh, so we just so when we brought them in prior to surgery, this is when we ran these uh, trials. And so this kind of gave us gave us a rough estimate that uh, could be used to control the, to to guide managers so they could uh, design their uh, their fire fire prescription accordingly. So for the fire prescription, um, this burn was carried out on May 8, 2008. Um, it called for a backing fire with a very low rate of spread. So because of that snake speed, the managers were going to try to create a very slow moving fire with a high residence time. The site was prepped in uh, the months and year leading up to this with, uh, again, brush pile creation. At the time of this burn, there were 35 brush piles on the burn unit. Uh, these are, and they had about approximately one ton of material each. And then as with, the, with most other, you know, with your other burns, uh, burn breaks were created around, this, the, burn, around the burn unit. Now for our data collection, um, in terms of our substrate and surface temperatures, remember we wanted to assess these uh, as refugia for the Massasaugas. We put out data loggers, and so the day of the burn, uh, I, I tracked the snakes and found refugia around them representative of what they would use when I had been approaching them for the last year. So these hummocks, burrows, and what have you. Uh, this was the most nerve-wracking part of the study because I, I waited a little bit too long the morning uh, that morning and I was just blindly sticking data loggers uh, <laughs> under hummocks and <laughs> hoping for the best. Uh, we also use temperature sensitive paint so on ceramic tiles. So if you can see here in this picture, 
on the ceramic tile. We had, I think it was 12 or 14 uh, different uh, styles, types of paint um, painted on these tiles to really just see what the, what the temperature of the fire was on the surface. So we had a tile that was about a foot above the ground, a tile that was right, it was on the ground but above the litter, and then a tile under litter, just to, to kind of assess the temperature of possible places where massive fogs would be. Then we also, uh, the day of the burn, went out and we put uh, the TNC science team put out uh, these burn poles that are were about eight feet high with uh, uh, markers on there and a flag on top to assess fire speed, fire height, intensity, et cetera. Um, and we had, a, we had people on the day of the burn that were specifically tasked with monitoring wind speed and collecting all of the fire data. So it was, kind of, it was quite an undertaking of the, the burn crew, uh, myself, uh, the, the people assigned to watch me to make sure I didn't get torched, and then the people taking data. So in, uh, this is what the, uh, the, some of the proposed burn units at the property looked like. Uh, for the burn unit that, that occurred for this part of the study was this middle, the mid-fen unit. And this was kind of just a rough, it looks a little blurry, sorry. This is just a rough diagram of the burn unit. It was a 6.1 hectare area of, and of the, the whole fen is 56.3 hectares. And uh, this was the desired ignition pattern. And on here, the yellow dots indicate the locations of snakes at that site. Um, prior on the day of the burn. So we had one down here on the south, five on the burn unit, one maddeningly right on the burn break, and then one up here uh, still pretty close to uh, where they were overwintering. And so this is again just another kind of like a schematic of what this study design for the fire data looked like. So around the snakes, the TNC science team set up these, these burn poles uh, in a manner that would allow them to really get um, some detailed data on them. And you can see here the, the, the fire direction for this moved kind of a northwesterly direction, and then the wind moved opposite. And so this is where our backing, this is again a backing fire, where the, the smoke is blowing opposite of the, the fire itself. Okay, so now we get down to the good parts. Um, you know, the, again, so we're just to rehash some objectives uh, we're, we wanted to look at for these snakes. Uh, so the direct effect. So uh, when we burned, uh, there were those five snakes on the burn unit, and unfortunately, two were killed. Uh, this one right here, the this one was the really crispy one. Um, this one, I kind of was worried about the day of the burn. We went out there and I tracked it. It was eight inches from a brush pile, and that kind of sent off some warning flags in my head. But, but that's what we were there for, and uh, that's exactly what happened. The snake fled into the brush pile, and... Uh, the body temperatures were <laughs> uh, pretty unreadable during the burn, just kind of like a high-pitched squeal uh, from the transmitter. This snake over here, it's uh, apparently the fire, it spooked and fled about 30 feet before the fire overtook it. Uh, I don't know, I can't speak for what goes through a snake's mind if it just panicked or if it couldn't find sufficient refugia or what happened, but uh, it was, it had moved locating it before the fire and then uh, after the fire it had moved some distance and then just was overtaken. Uh, we didn't see any other snakes uh, on the burn unit. We did a very thorough search. Uh, what, some of the, the, the TNC team said they heard a rattlesnake but couldn't find it. Um, I wasn't able to find it that day or any of the following days. Uh, there was one box turtle on the burn unit that had been searched, uh, some ground nesting and we've in, talk, in talks about this in the past, we've, we've received some criticism about, you know, you know, are you, how likely are you to find mass fogs after a fire? And uh, I, we could have missed them, but uh, I did find a scorched caterpillar. So we, we did a very thorough search, um, but that isn't to say that we accounted for everything. But for our track snakes, we, we did account for these two. Uh, surprisingly, the transmitter survived the burn. Uh, it was interesting. Sort of a pit tag. One of the more immediate effects of the following the fire is elimination of cover. So normally these are very cryptic snakes and they're hard to find. But after the burn, you can see they kind of stick out like a sore thumb and approaching them, you know, to track. It actually didn't have to track them after the burn. I could spot them from about 30 feet away and, you know, go double check. Uh, so we didn't have any mortality in our adults following the burn, but there was a definite, uh, you, you definitely could notice that the, there was something going on there from the structure. 
In terms of collecting success, uh, we found six new neonates and juveniles on the burn unit in the following the burn. Um, this is kind of a gray area for me because based on adult movements, and I'll, I'll kind of talk about this here in a second, and then just what the snake's doing at the time, I feel it's likely that they were at present at the time of the burn, but it's also, it's also possible that the, maybe the, the, the juveniles and neonates are more prone to move on to the burn unit. It's very hard to say, uh, and it's also, they could be easier to find. Juveniles of that size are difficult to locate, and the fact that we found six of them was pretty imp uh, not impressive, but it was, it was pretty neat. Um, but it's just kind of a, we're not quite sure there. We, we didn't find any new adults. Uh, I, we, we, we spent a lot of time out there uh, in that, that year and did not find any new adults on the burn unit. And uh, <clears throat> uh, we didn't see any immediate movement one way or another. So when we remember we wanted to assess um, uh, what the snakes, you know, if the snakes are moving onto the burn unit or moving off or if they're, you know, prefer preferentially using this burn area. And we didn't see any evidence of this. So our snakes on the burn unit stayed there uh, for about a month and uh, before they finally moved off the, the unit. And so we saw a similar pattern with the snakes um, uh, just around the area where they kind of skirted around the uh, the burn the burn unit is following the burn and so it was it was almost like everyone just kind of stayed put and so even that snake that was right along the burn unit that uh, we were, were hoping was going to move it, that would be, uh, definitely be the one to tell us it, uh, it didn't it just kind of stayed in one spot okay so um, our next objective, this was, the, again, this kind of comes back to our title here with the daily movements and our habitat utilization. Um, so following the burn, like I said, they were, they stuck out like a sore thumb. They're much easier to see, but they did spend a lot more time in burrows following the burn. So typically when I'd locate them, they would, uh, you know, if they were basking, they were near a hummock. Uh, but this behavior here was half in, half out of a burrow at this study site was, um, was pretty unusual. And I believe this was in response to the redu reduction of cover. I mean, this was, to me, this was good news because it means that they're not <laughs> a little bit smarter than we give them credit for. Um, so they did, they did spend a lot of this. It was very common in the months following the burn until there was uh, enough vegetative cover for them to kind of move around again. And this is kind of where I think that delayed movement following the burn kind of it all kind of pieces together. Um, there wasn't cover, so they were sticking close to burrows. The other snakes were do it were didn't uh, kind of avoid the area entirely. <clears throat> in terms of daily movement and home range size between the the three treatment units, remember on the unit, off the unit, and at the at low foundation, there was no significant difference in daily movement and home range size. So even though that the, we saw these snakes uh, spending more time in burrows, they were still moving around in the burn unit. And this is just kind of uh, the snake weights are just, it, I included this just because it's it's interesting to me. It was pretty inconclusive, but it's fun to see. Uh, you can see here that on the burn, it's tempting to see that the, this, this loss in two of the, the weight loss in two of the three snakes. Um, but we also saw, and I think I'm missing one here. I think I just didn't get weights on it. Um, but the weights are just all over the board. So the, in terms of the assessing the weights of snakes on the burn unit versus off the burn unit, it's really hard to tell. Um, for the microhabitat selection, this is just a, I kind of condensed uh, the uh, AIC models down into just text here just for simplicity. Um, so on the, again, this was the habitat assessment from the, the point uh, at, when we were tracking the snakes. And the, the big take home messages here that we, we had pretty decent R squared for our models. Um, and that they were selecting at these micro, at these different levels. Uh, surface temperature, light intensity, distance to water, overstory tree. Uh, we can see here that the control site had a few more variables. Uh, all of these variables, really what they are, uh, and we compare this with other studies, particularly the Moore and Gillingham study uh, from the east side of the state, are all variables that contribute to thermal regulation. And the most noticeable thing here to me is the selection of litter depth and cover the other sites where it's absent from the burn unit for obvious reasons. Um, so clearly, uh, they when they're when the litter depth is there, they're they're selecting for it, 
and that's just it's absent from the burn unit. And uh, that was interesting. In terms of our macro habitat and landscape scale analysis, uh, we had we ended up classifying our we had seven habitat types were available in the areas, and we had to combine them in three generic uh, classifications uh, for the analysis because of the sample size we had. And so grasslands are just your generic, uh, with elimination, excluding crops, are your herbaceous uh, grassy areas. Uh, the forests are going to be your, again, your general uh, forested areas. And the wetland are your low, wet uh, emergence, uh, kind of all inclusive. They're general categories, but uh, it's kind of the way we had to go. And you can see here, um, we, with the uh, macro habitat and landscape, uh, we didn't see necessarily see the hierarchical landscape use. They preferred wetlands at, at the Pawpaw Prairie Fence site and then preferred grasslands at the Edlow Foundation uh, from both scales. And unfortunately, this is due um, to the two of the snakes we had at the Edlow Foundation set up camp in a grass, grassland area. And I think 95% of their points were in that grassland area. So it's being very strongly driven by those two individuals. So for uh, the substrate and burrows and the fire data, uh, so the, the refugia temperatures, uh, with, so all those data loggers we had um, throughout the fire, it, they, they all stayed below critical thermal maximum for ectotherms. And so I think the highest temperature was someplace in the mid-30s. Uh, and this is uh, even, even the, the fire temporarily switched to a, uh, a head fire as passed over one of our snakes. And the, the, the hummock it was in still kept that temperature down. Uh, surface temperatures, uh, even though we had three different heights, the average was approximately 200 degrees Celsius. It really, the surface temperatures really didn't tell us a whole lot, but it's interesting data to have. Uh, so for, for the fire, uh, the, the managers were, were thrilled with the results. You know, it followed the prescription. Everything off went out without a hitch, and it met their management objectives. Uh, when everything was said and done, uh, you know, so the rate of spread was about uh, 2.6 to 4.8 feet per minute. And sorry, this is where this conversion, I messed that up. Um, but you can see, you know, this, this red here were our snake speeds. So the, <clears throat> in terms of meter per second, which is the one I did get correctly, um, <laughs> it all, it all kind of works out. Uh, very low flame length, 95% uh, of the area was burned. So this is a picture of the burn unit following that. Um, and again, there was a temporary shift uh, in wind that caused a head fire that passed over a snake, and this, this didn't last very long. It literally flared up and was gone in, I would say, even less than a minute, if not less than that. It was, it was very short, um, but it was right as it passed over a snake. And so uh, that was just very interesting from the refugia and fire and uh, management standpoint. Ah, pardon me. Okay, there we go. Uh, so this kind of will wrap this up here. This brings us down to the nitty-gritty of this. Um, so in terms of our first objective of examining the effects on the snakes, uh, we saw mortality in two of our five snakes. And uh, the temptation here is to apply this to the whole population and say, uh, is two out of five of every five snakes we burn acceptable? And the immediate answer is no. We, we know that's not a sustainable yield, uh, especially given some of these population models. And But with that's kind of jumped conclusions here, and uh, I, I'm, I really apologize for the teaser, but we will come back to this uh, when we discuss some more of our, uh, our fire recommendations. But in terms of the survival, I don't believe this is sustainable, and I, I think most people would agree with me, but there are ways to mitigate this. Um, in terms of our, the burn use, the use of the burn site, uh, we, we saw delayed movement uh, after the burn. Like I said, the snakes on the burn unit were moving around in there, but they spent more time in burrows, and the ones around, er, and ones outside of it uh, the ones in the north there skirted around the edge. Um, so it could just be that after a burn, you know, if, it, if the snakes are there, they hunker down and, you know, they start moving around again when the vegetation respond, uh, when the re vegetation regrows. And it's kind of what we'd expect of, you know, these, these species that, that co-evolved with natural fire regimes. We expect, we expect them to be behaviorally adapted. So fleeing to refugia um, and then spending more time in cover after a burn uh, all kind of hint at that. For habitat selection, again, they favored uh, these thermoregulatory variables. They're going to, like I said, it's one of the most important aspects. 
Uh, and again, litter and uh, coverage was were popped up as uh, important variables in the for the snakes that weren't on the burn unit. So this is kind of uh, an interesting fact that you know th that litter is litter and ground cover are important for them. But again, we did see them alter the behavior in response. So it, it still kind of adds to the possibly they might be uh, fire they might be a fire adapted species. At the uh, macro habitat and landscape scale, again, we didn't see any difference in usage, but we did see differences between the two sites. And again, that could be very site specific. We know that they will use their uh, use, use, use habitats depending on what's available, and it's not uncommon to see site to site site differences even within a small geographic area. Um, but again, this was the best control we could we could use, and uh, so we didn't see anything definitive there. For the uh, for um, evaluation of the refugia, again, those hummocks and burrows, uh, in the in this case, in the prairie fens, they they provided ample thermal protection. You know, they they didn't get too hot. The snakes were fine. Uh, one of the reasons behind assessing the refugia is, you know, a previous study had mentioned that, you know, you can you can it's easier to assess direct mortality, but what about snakes that hide underground and might succumb to uh, 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 subsurface temperatures, gases, what have you. Uh, we didn't see any evidence of that, uh, but again, this could just be our system. Uh, these refugia are, are pretty abundant in the habitat we're in, the prairie fen. Uh, originally, for the microhabitat models, distance to cover item or distance to refugia was one of the my uh, important my variables that I wanted to include. And then following the burn, I was able to see how many places, just how many places there were for them to hide in the absence of vegetation, let alone with the vegetation. And so I just ended up <laughs> tossing that variable out because it just became overwhelming. And again, this, this applies strictly to this, this site. I've talked to other researchers, uh, specifically down in uh, Squaw Creek in Missouri, where the habitat is a prairie, uh, is a prairie wetland, but it is, it is very different. So I would, I would exercise caution when applying this to some of these other locations that aren't specifically prairie fens. Uh, for the fire data, the, the fire met management goals. It was a very slow burn. Again, high residence time. We can see over here that uh, it did leave some patches, but this is pretty rare. This is actually, I think, along, along one of the, the, uh, the northeastern uh, area of the burn break. And, uh, you know, the, with our burn, uh, it was approximately 11% of the available habitat. And so this, is, this kind of ties back into what I said I was teasing you about with the two out of five snakes. So we know that there are more snakes on that study site. Uh, in those two years, I found 32. And prior to that, a colleague, my colleague Jen Moore had found, I believe, 16. Uh, I never had any recaptures of hers. Um, uh, but it's, uh, I, so we know that there are a bunch of snakes. There, 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 were, more, there were more snakes there than what we had tracked. Um, in addition uh, to the, the small area of the fen that we burned, there's another 20 to 40 hectares of suitable habitat uh, to the west of our site that I just didn't have access to because private property. Um, so by limiting the size of our burn, we minimize the impact on the pop. We hopefully minimize the impact on the population. So you saw those three burn units earlier. TNC burns those their site that site in a rotational basis. So yes, if you apply two out of five, the whole population. If you, I mean, if, so if you burn the whole area at once, and let's say a wildfire scenario, that could be very detrimental. But minimizing the impact by by the by doing these smaller burns uh, is is very likely to be more beneficial than these uh, some of these large scale burns that I know occur in other areas. Now, a big caveat with all of this is we don't know um, uh, what. The, the effect of human disturbance was. So I, I said earlier, this was, a, this was a huge undertaking. And so there are more people on this burn than would be normal. And again, we put out those, the fire monitoring posts around the snakes the morning of the burn. And we know in the literature that uh, in, in the presence of humans, the snakes can alter their behavior. Uh, I've been following these, these snakes for, well, actually I started it in 2006, but um, so I've been following them around for a while. and. Uh, just based on what I observed, they behave normally, but it is not to say that the additional presence of people um, 
you know, didn't didn't impact them. And so that's that's a uh, it's, an, it's an issue. But again, that was the best uh, it, was the, it was the best way to get our data, and uh, you know, the burn was going to happen eventually. So for management recommendations, like I just kind of talked about, uh, burning smaller plots and leaving a lot more um, uh, these, these patchy areas and mosaic in the burn unit, if you will, uh, are likely to limit the impact on the whole population. So these, these patchy burns uh, will, will leave more area for the snakes to hide and, and hopefully just benefit them. We found that in, in our habitat, again, that they would hide in just darn near everything they could, in everything they could find. Um, but in cases where that's not the not an option, these patchy burns may be beneficial for the snakes. Now here's the uh, <laughs> the brush piles, and this is I can already see the the, the text flying over there. Um, this is these these brush piles have been a source of frustration since we started talking about this. <laughs> um, it's important to remember that these brush piles, uh, if active management is occurring at the site. It should be a one-time uh, or very limited event. Uh, these, in this case, there were a lot of brush piles started because, again, TNC was uh, had an aggressive treatment plan going, and uh, they they just they did this this needed to get burned. This was all the slash from the buckthorn and invasives and what have you, and it was going to burn eventually. So, and uh, for some reason, now Jack, help me out here. I think you'd mentioned something that winter burning wasn't an option at that time. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll jump in here because it, it, it's good with the brush pile. Um, everybody needs to remember that this fen was really threatened by glossy buckthorn and other invasives, reed canary, grass rig, mighty, so on. Um, we started the restoration in 2004, actually, but it really didn't get going to 2005. Third of the fen was really impacted by adult glossy buckthorn. A lot of that adult stuff is cut, herbicided. Um, people often say, why can't you take this and pile them in the uplands or scatter them? Um, I invite anybody to come out to these fens and try to carry brush piles. Yeah, and remember, every brush pile is about a ton of fuel. So it's not realistic, both in time and labor, to move brush piles out of a fen unit. It's just not realistic with labor or cost. Um, so the approach is to burn them. Um, Burning was done in the winter. Where possible, the piles are burned in the winter. But again, you also have to remember constraints and budget. That's additional trips down, additional burning. They may not burn complete. There are options where it is better to combine all the burning into one time where you're doing both prescribed burn and reduction of the brush piles when you have a crew there all at one time. So you know, for better or worse, that's the approaches to that. Thank you. Yeah. So I, again, the brush piles. It was. Uh, it was a. It was just. It was just the way it, it was. You know, as Jack said, um, moving them off the burning it could be costly, and burning them in the winter isn't always an option. And additionally, moving them it creates a lot of foot traffic, which uh, can further affect your your, your study site. So, um, we know the, the, that snakes will use these brush piles, and. Uh, in the case of this burn unit, these brush piles were uh, pretty were pretty close to where the snakes. Uh, some of the brush piles are pretty close to where the snakes overwinter, and so what you have here is kind of a an unfortunate perfect setup for uh, creating favorable traps, if you will, for the snakes. Where these brush piles, we know they use them for thermal regulation and prey, and it provides a nice convenient place to, especially during that time of year. Now I emphasize that time of year because brush pile use. At least from what I saw in, in the snakes that we tracked, and again, it was a small sample size, and it's hard to apply it to all of the snakes, was uh, pretty limited to the early season. So once it gets hot in the in the summer, these fens are open, and it's going to be very it's going to be very hot on top of the brush piles. They might receive refuge under it, but my uh, there's like a certain cutoff uh, pretty much once it got warmer, where the snakes stopped using brush piles. Um, so constructing them near open wintering sites. Could be especially detrimental because they are going to be attracted to it uh, during that time of year when they're they're slow lethargic they're really trying to warm up they're they're a little more risk prone if you will because uh, there are other places to bask but these these brush piles are very tempting and again remember this is a one-time thing there's a lot of there's, there's a ton of different things that could have been done with these brush piles it's not always feasible and so in the case of if brush piles are something that has to happen 
then it should happen once, and then done. Uh, just something to bear in mind. And, and Matt, Which, I'll just yeah, I'm going to jump in real quick too because we did have um, we had a lot of good discussion going on the brush files. One person said, "Don't move them; just drop, uh, chop and drop." Um, especially if you know you'd be using prescribed fire later. Again, remember, 35 tons of fuel in a in a six hectare area. If we had chopped and dropped everything would have been covered by the buckthorn. Um, so that would have impacted both the burning, movement of snakes, other animals, everything else. So again, there's not necessarily a perfect solution. Yes, burning in the winter is better, but there are times where we cannot burn brush piles in the winter. We were not able to in this case. Yeah, I, I think everyone's getting antsy because I'm uh, approaching my time here, so I promise I'm almost done, and we can continue the uh, brush pile discussion here in just a few seconds. Um, so just in terms of overrearing sites, uh, managers should really attempt to identify them prior to management. And I can already hear some people laughing in my head. Uh, it's easier said than done. Because uh, down here we see an example of this is at the fen we're doing the, uh, the work at. They, TNC went in and pulled, uh, and pulled out a lot of these invasives in this area. And this orange flag here is where one of the snakes overwintered. And it was kind of uh, the machinery or foot had kind of crunched the burrow opening and the snake was kind of wedged half in, half out of it when it emerged. So in a perfect world, it would be nice for managers to identify general areas that look like they are good for mass saugas to overwinter and, you know, plan management around it. So don't put the brush piles there. Maybe hold off on burning those areas uh, at certain times. You know, you, you know that uh, during times of year around those overwintering sites, they'll be a little bit more, a little more lethargic. So those might be areas to avoid. Okay, so again, I, I promise I'm wrapping this up quickly. Uh, future research, I'd like to, I think I would like to see, um, you know, some long-term monitoring of, of what happens after the fire. We we only had a one year, uh, like a one-year shot or one-season shot, and so it'd be really curious to see what happens. You know, if there's a delayed structural response the following year, uh, to really look at the prey response following the fires to see uh, how that'll affect snakes. And the, the key component that we missed with this study, just because of the timing of my grad project and everything, is overwintering success following the fire. So we know we saw those weights kind of bounce around, and the, the snakes in this study all behaved normally, if you will, uh, for normal for a snake after the fire. They were found eating, uh, copulating. A uh, few of them gave birth. Um, so we know that they were, in, in terms of that season, that they behaved normally. But in terms of overwintering success, that's the clincher. You know, did they was were the resources so sparse during the active season that they went into their overwintering sites with low fat reserves and uh, they died during that time? And we know overwintering mortality can be pretty significant for uh, reptilian species, and so that's that is one thing that I'd like to I would love to assess. And a uh, caveat with this long-term monitoring is just that, you know. In the light of you know having these disjunct populations that are very small, um, we might not have a lot of wiggle room when it comes to term this thing, when it comes to this long term modeling monitoring. So that'll be a decision that has to be made. Is you know with the with the results we have at hand, um, with some of these these studies of smaller samples, uh, are these, is this what we're going to have to work with to make some of these decisions? Interest another interesting thing would be to look at the different types of fires. So for the the backing fire, flanking fire, head to fire. You know, the backing fire had a low, a long residence time. It's possible other types of fire would move faster and create more skips. Or, sorry, we know that other types of fire will move faster and create more skips and create more mosaic in the in the burn unit. Um, uh, and again, kind of going in along with that line, is uh, burning at different times of year. So burning during the growing season when there might be more moisture and humidity in the plants and the, and the surface there could again help create more of these skips to be beneficial for the snakes and also at the same time reduce these fuel loads and fight in bases. Uh, I'd love to see, uh, to explore the, the cues that the snakes respond to. So in, uh, the, in our case, there was a backing fire where the smoke was moving opposite the direction of the fire. So if, it could be possible that uh, fires where the smoke goes ahead of the fire, the smoke is a cue to alert the animals to uh, to flee, um, we know that the, with their their loreal pits, they're very sensitive, but kind of a range issue there. And back to my overwintering site thing, that's just because that's uh, that's kind of my new project. Um, we've been working on a collaborative project with some other mass slaughter researchers 
uh, generating predictive models for overwintering sites in some of these management areas to kind of help managers uh, pinpoint areas that maybe should be treated with more caution uh, throughout their burning season. Uh, with that, uh, we're going to wrap things up here. I'd like to, I'll love to thank everyone who helped me out with this project. It was, again, a huge undertaking. It took a lot of people uh, assisting, and it's particularly my funding sources and the Edlow Foundation for uh, putting putting me up and housing me, and then Dr. Maney, who did all of our surgeries uh, at his own cost. So that was, that was pretty amazing. And uh, with that, I will take any questions. Uh, thank you for listening. Okay. Um, there's a flurry of questions. <laughs> um, All right. I'll, I'll try to – let me see here. Should I oh, scroll no, back? Or? Well, no. We'll, we'll get them. I think Craig and I have them. Um, I want to hit a question that was asked um, right in the beginning. Um, somebody asked, you know, with Canadian Massasagas, um, do they live in the – mainly live in the woods? I'd have to go back oh. and find that one. <laughs> that is, let me see here. I think it was in reference to the fact that you're looking at a lot of wetland habitat. Oh, yeah. So uh, WI, don't Canadian ones live in the woods? Um, that is, I, I've heard that there is, so some of their, their, their studies, uh, I think the Weatherhead and prior, there was one in 2006 that was looking at Massasauga habitats, and they found that they did use more um, wooded habitats in their studies. And again, they, this is, when I was, gen I was very general in my description of Massasauga habitats, there are very, we're going to see a lot of differences site to site, and the, it is an, unusual to see them in these, these woods, although um, in some of our studies, in some of the places I've been, they do tend to use wooded wetlands uh, for, over, for overwintering. And in this project, that kind of got lumped into the wetlands area. So we do see, and if you look at some of these studies, you do tend to see more of this wooded habitat usage, although not as heavily as that study. So again, that was just a generalized statement for these prairie fens. And again, throughout this talk, I really tried to stress that a lot of the results and a lot of what we're seeing are specific to this habitat in particular. Um, so yes, there are going to be differences. And ultimately, it will be up to the managers and uh, conservation biologists in the area to decide what is appropriate given these unique habitats. Did that answer the question? Yes. Okay. Greg, did you have one, I think? Uh, I had one question um, about the effects of uh, removing the cover. Um, yeah. I was wondering about how, how long it did take for the vegetation to regrow enough um, for them to find cover. And uh, then also, if you burn prior to emergence, um, would that be hypothesized to uh, reduce survival because they're uh, slower and harder to get around uh, and uh, all of their their cover has been removed at that time? Okay, yeah, so I'll take the first one. So uh, the cover after the burn, the, I was, I never see, I mean, this is, I think this is old hat for the land managers, but it was really cool to see how quickly the vegetation started to regrow. Um, it was about a month and a half to two months after the burn before the vegetation was tall enough to a point where, and again, this is, it's so hard to say this from a snake's point of view, where they weren't spending all their time in burrows anymore. And again, they were still moving around, but they're just kind of burrow hopping. Um, so there was a little bit of a, of a delayed response there. Uh, but, and again, because they, they also like to use that litter. Um, so they were, again, they were just kind of adapting themselves or adjusting their behavior to what they had available. And that's actually, your second question is actually a really good point that uh, I hadn't thought about before. So depending on the timing of the burn before emergence, so if, if, since they do tend to favor this litter, these litter areas, removing that litter um, could have a couple, you know, yeah, it could just reduce that cover and make them really easy pickings during that time of year when they're going to be lethargic, don't have cover. Um, and yeah, so that, that is a very good point, and that's another potential side effect of these winter burns. Um, I'll, uh, David, uh, I'll, I think I can pick this question up real quick here. Um, I think e this is just a, a confusion of terms here with uh, by, with uh, the Massasaugas and the the, uh, the fires. So, refugia is the unburned areas. Uh, I can I think I've heard of that in terms of you know. So when you you have a patchy burn, your unburned spots or your burns outside of your burn refugia, 
for the snakes, refugia are, in terms of for the way I was describing them, are places for these snakes to hide. So these hummocks and burrows that they use as refuges. So uh, apologize for the confusion there. If that, I hope that answers your question. Matt, we also had a question on, and I think we touched a lot of the brush pile stuff, but if not, somebody go ahead and do it in the chat. Um, let's see. We did have a question on the head fire. Yeah. Head firing versus back firing. Uh, uh, Jerry, is there a specific question? Is what a it, the question is, would a head fire with a faster rate of spread allow for less surface heat concentration? And that's less consumption of duff or leaf litter. Yeah, and so would that be a consideration? Yeah, so we, we that's some some we've talked about after this is you know the different types of fires. So a head fire could move faster, does doesn't have as much residence residence time and uh, doesn't the you know again the heat isn't going to penetrate as far. And you know, we found that the the where they were taking cover uh, provided enough thermal refuge, but um, if they, that wasn't the possibility, you know, kind of a quick assessment, you're in a flatter area that doesn't have these spots, then um, it is possible that a fire like that could um, could be just, it could create those desired effects, yes. And that's a good question, asking about the head fire versus the back fire. Um, our approach had been to use mostly backing fires because we were looking for the long residence time because based off of many uh, prairie fen restoration burns, that got a much better fire effect for a lot of the conservative uh, species that were there. I'm checking to see if there are any additional questions. Doesn't look like it right now. Craig, do you have any additional? Oh, we just had one come in. Um, were any other herps? Oh, we had a couple come in now. <laughs> Chat boxes. Let me let me find them here. So, were there any other herbs found in searching the burn units, or Matsusagas the only ones? Oh uh, yeah. Or so only, uh, only, only mortalities. Excuse me. Oh, only mortality. Yeah. So that was the. They were the only immediate mortality um, found in the burn unit after the burn. Again, we did find uh, that turtle. Uh, I found and the following day. I found a a neonate that had been chewed on by something. Uh, so that, that definitely, it wasn't scorched, it wasn't, the fire didn't actually kill it. Um, so that, it was, uh, yes, it was just the mass of sagas. It was, yeah, uh, I guess the, the, the ground nesting bird eggs, if you want to count those. And I know going back, there was a question that Alyssa was asking about the box turtles. Um, there were actually two box turtles that were found in the unit, one right after the burn, one the next day. One of the box turtles did have some rippling effect, and they were found more up on top of the Hama. Um, that turtle survived all the way through. There's a private landowner down there who often tracked the turtles and kept an eye on that one. Uh, the other was a box turtle that had been found in between two hummocks, and that had no evidence of any heat from the fire. Yeah, um, I, I've heard of that kind of response with box turtles of just getting into these these low areas and. I apologize for the confusion with that question. I thought I could be pretty slick and type an answer while I was talking, and it turns out that I wasn't the case because I typed the wrong answer initially. So yes, there was a there were burn box turtles. <laughs> um, we have another question. As you mentioned, some dates in the spring to avoid burning after to prevent fire mortality. Are there dates in the fall that you recommend is safer to resume burning activities for this same reason? So you mentioned to avoid burning after. Uh, yeah, these, and so these recommendations come from like the Massasauga handbook, and so these are so pretty much in general when the snakes are inactive, are going to be the times where you can burn when you don't run the risk of mortality for the snakes. Um, so if, if mortality is the if reducing mortality is the end goal, then those are your times to burn. Uh, so that's that. Uh, I hope that answers that question. Uh, because yeah, those aren't necessarily my recommendations, but those are uh, those are kind of what uh, people have suggested. Um, another question we have is uh, knowing fire is important for habitat maintenance and direct mortality occurs with fire or can occur with fire. Um, do you have a general recommendation for burning in size, percent site habitat, and fire return interval? Oh man! Oh, that's uh, <laughs> you want wow. Me to take 
way to way to really uh, hit hit one. Um, so I, it's very hard for me to make recommendations for like that based on our study size with the small sample and just having, uh, you know, just just one year. I um, mean, so our percent of the percent of our area, what we had 11 percent, and we killed two snakes. Um, so it's, it is very hard for me to answer the percent habitats and fire return interval, I believe, will depend on the habitat, but Jack, maybe you can help me out with their fire to return interval one. Uh, for prairie fans, it's going to be anywhere from 5 to 15 years, um, but again, I, I need to stress that when you're doing restoration of these prairie fans, it, it's dependent on how impacted they are by uh, non-native species and so on. So sometimes you need to be more aggressive initially to try to uh, basically restore as much of the fen as many of the species as possible. Um, this talk is a classic example of looking at individual species but also trying to manage for habitat and all the competing objectives there are. There's no perfect answer, basically. Um, Jen asked, isn't the recommended way to burn date March 15th? And I think you did say May 15th. Um, Michigan has a CCAA and there are burn date recommendations. Um, I think that March 15th date is dependent on where it is in the state. So we'd have to take a look at that. Um, I would be able to dig that information out and we can actually get that posted up on uh, the website. Um, the Lake State's website, and Craig should be able to get it up on the Tallgrass Prairie website so we can get those dates for you guys. Yeah, I'm looking through my sources right now. I know that there is, so the May 15th, there, there was a combination of a couple of different guides looking, I was looking at, and so there's the general recommendation, and there was, there was one place that had said um, that it ex had an extended burn, a, a burn window for wetlands specifically. So that, that might be where that confusion is coming from, but if it's, uh, if you'd like, I can definitely double check my sources on that. Yes, like I said, and we can we can uh, link to this off the website to show kind of what the various recommendations are depending on where you are in the state and which state it is what the recommendations are for. Um, yeah. so I think Wisconsin has a little bit different recommendations. Um, another question we had is what was the status of the buckthorn on the site? Had it resprouted from cutting? Did you have leaf out? Do you think burn killed the buckthorn? I'm going to let Jack oh. field that question since sure. I was definitely <laughs> the snake end of the study. <laughs> um, pretty much the, the methods for treating adult buckthorn and seedling buckthorn are kind of standardized. They've been worked out. So the adult buckthorn, very little treating responded. Um, I really wish we could have a picture in the slideshow here. And it's a photo point, or we had a lot of photo points to show what it looked like before any management occurred and a few years later. And there are pictures where you could see nothing but buckthorn, and two growing seasons later, you could see prairie fan stretching out in front of you. Um, buckthorn seedlings, the strategy there is you're going to either be uh, doing a very careful application of herbicide or using a technique called spot burning uh, with, buck, uh, with uh, propane torches. Um, and if you don't get a handle on the buckthorn seedlings, you're going to have clumps of buckthorn or dense buckthorn within about three years or less. Um, as far as burning, um, part of the strategy for using prescribed fire into late spring or through the growing season is because the impact on the buckthorn, the negative impact on the glassy buckthorn is much greater when you're using fire besides the other important biological effects from fire. Okay, um, another question, is there further study of pawpaw prairie fen planned? Um, I do not have an answer to that. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I don't either. Um, yeah, we'd have to, we, that question could be directed to the uh, Michigan chapter of the Nature Conservancy, because they are the owners of the preserve now, to see what their intent is. Uh, looks like there's a question about overwintering areas. Um, uh, I would say the best way, um, would be uh, wait till I finish my modeling work. Uh, no, I really just um, looking at the literature for snakes, I would say, in the area because, again, like with some of these other uh, populations, you see a lot of different usage uh, in a small geographic area. So even talking with people in Michigan, uh, you know, crayfish burrows are typically used. Uh, that's, you know, very common. 
I didn't see my snakes as a single crayfish burrow. They were all root systems and hummocks. Um, so it might be you might be best suited in that in that instance to find literature that is near your site and identify potential areas based on the literature, and then conduct a spring survey to see if you see massasaugas basking in that area. Um, they don't they aren't communal over our hibernators like we see with like the timber rattlesnakes and such. And so in terms of an overwintering site, it will be like a generalized area. So you could have something like a, a buffer around uh, these locations of an estimate of where it would be ideal. Uh, that would be my suggestion. Uh, that, that, is, that is hard. Um, and so that's going to, again, I think it's going to be very site specific. Hey, Matt, we had another question. I don't know if you can see it there. Mass is starting to fend and then move to the upland prairie later in the season. My question is to reduce mortality. It seems like the wetland burns should be earlier than the prairie burns. But you could address what you found with home ranges or what uh, Jen found with home ranges at uh, Iser Fen Preserve. Yeah, so the in this case, um, at our at the study site at Pawpaw, we didn't the that upland site had been was what was that area that had been flattened. And so they didn't actually have access to that. They stay, our snakes stay in the wetlands um, the entire season. Uh, but if, if they do, the, if you can, if you are in an area where that, shit, where that behavioral shift is um, pretty well timed, then yeah, I, I would imagine that to re reduce mortality in one of those habitats or the other, just burn when you know, when you think they're going to be uh, more likely to be in one, in one of those areas. That's good. And, and again, um, it's dependent on the fire effects you're looking for. Um, you might be able to burn in these prairie uplands earlier to achieve the effects than you can in a lot of the prairie fen habitat. Um, yeah. Jen, and Jen just responded. Just, go, ahead. go ahead, Matt. Oh yeah, and Jen just, Jen just responded with a similar uh, point that she never, that the, her snakes didn't use uh, any, of the up, any of the upland areas. Um, so. Yeah, that kind of really just does. I should have I should have known that, but uh, that does definitely speak to the fact that it's going to be very uh, dependent on the area. Because the Edlow Foundation, which was much closer to the Papa Prairie Fen than the Ives Road Prairie Fen site where Jen Moore was, uh, they did exhibit kind of that shift of these, these upland sites. So it's it is all just uh, going. I think site specific is going to be the best way to go. Um, in the absence of funding for research to do that. Then it's going to, you know, maybe just field mon just observational monitoring and, uh, you know, kind of the, the best guess with the with the data you have at hand. All right. Um, I see a few more people typing, and this has been excellent. We'll see if there's questions for us here. Otherwise, we will be wrapping up uh, the webinar. Um, Matt, do you have any, I guess, final thoughts? Will we see if uh, another question coming in? Uh, no, I mean, I, I, I think the, the key thing to uh, remember is that this is this was again, it was a small sample size. It was uh, it was a unique area. This is at the um, thing. Uh, it's it, it it was under the 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 influence of previous disturbance. So it could just it could it might be not just the fire was what was guiding some of these, these patterns and processes we saw with the snakes. It, it could be delayed responses from the 2006 burn, from the construction, from the altered hydrology. Uh, there's, just, there's, there's a lot of different factors going into this. And so while I do think that we did see some, uh, get some pretty uh, interesting results from this, uh, it should be noted that there, uh, as with everything, there are going to be uh, some caveats. Excellent. Um, and we did have one. It's not a question come in, but uh, Alicia with the Michigan DNR clarified that the uh, Michigan CCAA for Massasauga, the dates are November 15th through March 15th. Okay. I'm assuming that the CCAA is more recent than uh, <laughs> when we were burning, uh, but that's definitely good to know. I appreciate the. I appreciate that, Alicia. If you could do me a favor and send me the recent CCAA, that would be fantastic. Okay, okay, I'm just looking to see if there's additional questions. 
Um, and, and correct, the CCAA, a number of people have said the CCAA for Michigan is actually not final. It's still just in draft form. Okay. But that is what is uh, suggested uh, in the management recommendations is um, pretty much no restrictions on burn activities in that November 15th to March 15th. And then there are, are uh, burning is not, um, you can burn after that March 15th date, but as a variety of restrictions that are listed in the CCAA. Gotcha. It varies by the site. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, then that's kind of what we've, oh, we, we got kind of what I was hinting at here is, I, is it site dependent is going to be the most important thing, and I think, uh, you know, continued research will definitely uh, help answer some of these questions. Um, we'll address one last one here, <laughs> but these are some excellent questions. Um, Jen just asked, from a fire standpoint, that March 15th day, it is pretty much impossible, though. Um, yes, it, it is very tough to burn before March 15th and get the effects you need. I'm not saying you can't do it, you can, but you're really reducing the effectiveness of fire as an ecological process. So again, um, Matt's talk really does highlight the dilemma that any manager faces trying to restore and manage these types of habitats where you're trying to make use of ecological processes like fire, but at the same time not impact some of the uh, conservative species that are residing there. Yeah, and yeah, so that, that was an excellent answer, Jack. Thank you. Um, <laughs> sure. All right, um, we will wrap this up. I really appreciate people staying on and uh, all the excellent questions. Um, I would like to thank Matt and Craig and everyone online for joining us this afternoon for a great webinar and a, and a great discussion. Um, I'm sure that if you have any additional uh, questions, um, you can direct them either to Matt directly or myself or Craig, and you'll be able to find our various emails if you go to the Lake States website and look at the specific web page for this webinar. Um, we will have this webinar. It is being recorded right now, so this will be available on both the Lake States Consortium website and the Tallgrass Prairie and Oak Savannah website. Um, hope to have that up by early next week. So if anybody missed the webinar or if it wasn't responding live, you would be able to take a look at the recording or direct other people to the recording of the webinar. Um, we do have, move to the slide, our next webinar for the Lake States is coming up next week, next Thursday, it's every 20th. It's going to be at 2 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Central. It's assessing the drivers of the spring dip in foliar contact and their potential impact in forest fire behavior. And this will be presented by Matt Jolly, a research ecologist, uh, Forest Service. Um, finally, I'd encourage you to please take a few seconds, provide us with any feedback in today's webinar. Uh, when you close the webinar window, there should be a short web-based survey that will pop up. Um, please take the survey if you can, because this survey information is very important to help us better serve your fire science needs. Um, that concludes today's webinar. Thanks again to Matt and everyone for participating today. Uh, have a great rest of the day. And Matt, if you could just stay on the line just a minute. Yeah, not a problem. Thank you, everyone, for attending. I really appreciate it.